Um, my name is Ashling O'Brien. I'm on the committee of Atheist Ireland. Atheist Ireland is a volunteer-run advocacy group. We promote atheism and reason over superstition and supernaturalism. We promote an ethical, secular society where the state does not support or finance or give special treatment to any religion. But Atheist Ireland does not have an official position on veganism. So everything I say about veganism, on my head be it if I get it wrong. So um, I remember very clearly when I stopped eating meat, I was in my early 20s at the time and I was traveling to Limerick. I was staying overnight with a family that I didn't know particularly well, um, they were friends of, of friends. Um, in the morning when I got up, they had very nicely in their mind cooked me a breakfast. Um, the breakfast consisted of meat bacon, sausages, but also kidney, black and white pudding. And as a meat eater, these are foods I wouldn't normally have gone for. But being polite and Irish, I ate what was put down in front of me. I have to say, it was, it was disgusting. I really didn't enjoy eating that particular meat because it wasn't what I would normally choose. But later that day, I was on my way back to Dublin on the bus and it was springtime and I could see the lambs in the fields. And for the first time, I made a connection between the meat I had eaten that morning because I hadn't enjoyed it and what I was seeing in the fields. Um, and of course I knew where meat came from. I knew, I knew that a leg of lamb is a lamb's leg. But for some reason that day, something just clicked. And I think what it was looking back is I was faced really clearly with the evidence of my actions. And I felt disgusted with myself and I felt angry with myself. Um, but I stopped eating meat that day. Um, it took me 20 years to come to the same realisation about the egg and dairy industry. Um, I've never been a particularly fast learner. But uh, it was in this room actually three years ago when Laura from Nara was giving a talk and she was at talking to the vegetarians in the room and asking them to consider um, veganism and, and gave her evidence for veganism and why we should consider it. And I came to the very same realisation. And again, I felt the same feelings of disgust and anger that I had continued doing, taking part in this practice. And I began transitioning that very day to veganism. And when I look back on my journey towards atheism, I realised that there's a really close mirroring between these two journeys. So I was baptised a Catholic and I was indoctrinated into the Catholic faith, which I would think in, in Ireland, maybe the majority of you in this room had a similar experience. And all the beliefs and practices of Catholicism were taught to me as facts. And I took them in as a child unquestioningly because the people who were teaching me these facts were also teaching me maths and geography and science. There was no reason why I would question the religious facts that they were also teaching me. And then my move towards atheism began with me questioning what I had been raised to believe as truth. And I thought a lot about religious beliefs and about beliefs in general. And this is one area where I think we can really look at the commonalities between atheism and veganism. Um, usually when we believe something, we carry out a mental exercise in our head. We weigh up the evidence, whether or not the evidence supports the belief that we hold. Um, we believe our partners are faithful to us until we see evidence. And then we really want to examine that evidence and make sure that we're not just misunderstanding something. Um, we believe that vaccinating our children will keep them safe from potentially harmful diseases because the evidence is, is, tells us that. We believe that leaving our house by the front door is the better option than leaving by the first floor window. The evidence has taught us that lesson as well. So we've weighed up the evidence and we've come to these conclusions. And we have a name for something, believing in something that we don't have evidence for. And we call that faith. And religion will tell us that faith is a virtue, that it's good to believe in things that you don't have evidence for. But in every other area of our life, we wouldn't accept holding beliefs without evidence. We'd immediately start to question why we're holding these beliefs. Um, so that faith could be faith in a supernatural deity that we believe intervenes and intercedes on our behalf if we, if we plead enough with it. Or it could be faith that non-human animals are somehow um, worth less than us, that they feel less than us, that their lives are less important to them than the taste of our lunch is to us. 
And a large part of how we end up holding beliefs that are based on faith is down to indoctrination and down to the norms of the culture and the society that we are raised in. And we're very quick to notice when there is unusual belief contents in those who are outside of our culture or outside of our, our own religious uh, uh, beliefs. Um, so when we look at other religions, we can see the absurdity in some of the claims that, that they make, but we're much less slow to look at our own religious beliefs or our own cultural norms and recognise those same issues. Um, and particularly so when we're in a culture that the majority of people all go along with and agree with these beliefs. Someone may recognise that screenshot from their childhood. If I was to say, a pint of milk, and you respond, helps your bones, and then bones, then bones need calcium, and that's a natural law. You remember that advertisement from your childhood? And apart from the fact that it was really weird that they had this life-size wooden dummy in the children's bedroom, which I never really understood, we unquestioningly agreed with, yes, a pint of milk helps your bones, and that's a natural law, because it was backed up with a little bit of science, a child's got more bones than a grown-up's got. The next picture I want to show you is this. It's a very short little video from 1950s Ireland. But even though it's dated, a lot of us who are educated in the Catholic uh, tradition will remember something similar. This is the Maid Possession in Inchicore. And I remember, and I'm not so my education didn't happen in the 1950s, but I remember our teacher uh, bringing us around the school grounds on a freezing cold day in May, and we'd wear communion dresses. And if you were the communion year, you got to go to the front of the procession. If you weren't the communion year, but your sister, maybe your big sister made her communion the year before, you'd be in her communion dress. Or if you made your communion the year before, previous, you'd be squeezed into the dress that fit you last year. And we were walked around and we carried flowers and we put these flowers at the foot of a stone statue. And no one blinked an eyelid. No one thought, why have we got our children dressed as miniature brides? because it was perfectly culturally acceptable practice. I think to people outside of our culture would probably look at children dressed as miniature bride brides and raise an eyelid. The next one, this was an advertisement. Uh, some of you may remember this one. It was um, The Rasher is King. It was set in a country village and it started off with a man climbing the, the roof and they could hear the church bell in the background and he dropped a red handkerchief and all the men had rashers pinned their clothes and they set off running through the village with a pack of beagles following them and I think it was possibly done to the tunes of a, um, a, I don't know, some Irish band and uh, yeah there's nothing more macho in Irish than running through the streets with slabs of dead animal pinned to you but it was really putting it into the Irish culture this is what's acceptable meat is part of our culture it's part of our identity and no one was questioning it this little video, if anyone gets a chance to see it, it's set, um, they're, they're actually speaking um, Portuguese in it, and it's set in a Catholic church in somewhere in South America. The pre I mean, it's a very familiar scene to anyone who's raised in the Catholic faith. It's obviously a priest and altar boys on the altar. But as the children line up and go on to the altar, each one, the priest gives them a slap across the back of the head and pulls the hair and tosses them back and forth. One little boy tries to avoid it by getting on his hands and knees and crawling past the priest. The priest gives him a kick in the arse as he goes past. Now, to us, there's something very familiar about this, but yet yeah, we've never seen that. You watch this and you think, I'm watching child abuse here. It's really deeply uncomfortable, you know, when you watch it. And even though it's familiar, we recognise it's not what we've been indoctrinated into. It's not part of our culture. This picture here... Um, is the Jewish practice of um, uh, slaughtering chickens. Um, so it's an Orthodox Jewish ritual of killing chickens to transfer sins onto the birds. This is a description. Before slitting the chickens' throats, men take roosters and women take hens and then swing them around their heads saying uh, three times, saying, this is my substitute, this is my exchange, this is my atonement. This fowl will go to death, and I will enter upon a good and long life. And this is still practiced today in modern-day Brooklyn, despite many attempts in court cases by animal activists to get the practice banned. It hasn't been banned because it falls under the, the heading of freedom of religion. The next one I don't want to show you an image of, so I picked this one instead. 
The next practice I just want to talk about is, um, it actually took place this, earlier this month, and this is an, uh, an extract from an article from the newspaper Pakistan Today. And it says, Tanners expect collection of around 7 million hides from sacrificial animals in Id season. The numbers of cows slaughtered this Id season was expected to be 2.3 to 2.5 million. This is in Pakistan alone. On the other hand, the number of goats slaughtered during the past three days was projected to be 3.7 to 3.8 million. Collection of sheep skins was expected to be around 0 0.8 million this season, making the total number of hides around 7 million. And then the article's, article goes on, not to point out that this is a, an, an absolutely disgusting abuse, but to complain about the falling costs of animal hides. And this is where faith-based beliefs can lead us. They can lead us to the slaughter of 7 million animals for no other reason than religious beliefs. And these practices often continue because many of us are unwilling or nervous to criticise what, because they don't want to be seen to stepping on the toes of other cultures or other religions. And then they continue under the guise of freedom of religion. And let me be really clear, I support freedom of religion in the same way that I support freedom from religion. But the right to practice one's religious beliefs ends once those beliefs begin to negatively impact on the rights of others. And as a vegan, for others for me include both human and non-human animals. And as an atheist, I don't believe that our understanding of right or wrong, moral or immoral, ethical or unethical, just or unjust, has been revealed to us by a supernatural deity or is written in one holy book or another. And this is a very different position to the majority of people who do hold religious beliefs and do find um, revelation within these holy books. But as an atheist, I think we've got to figure this stuff out for ourselves. And so if right and wrong, or ethical or unethical, isn't revealed to us, then how do we begin to work, at, work out what is right and wrong? Well, we've evolved certain characteristics, such as em empathy, fairness, and compassion. And we have evolved as social animals, and our ability to cooperate with each other is integral to this socialization. So, in fact, if we look at these so-called divine revelations in these holy books, it doesn't take us very long to start finding very dubious ethical stances. Um, Genesis 1.25, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and the birds of the heaven, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And many religions will have similar beliefs and similar teachings. But what loving deity condemns sentient beings into slavery? And what, oh, it's fine if they're slaves as long as we treat them humanely? There is no humane way to own another life, just as there's no humane way to take the life of a sentient being that doesn't want to die. And wouldn't a loving God command us to show compassion towards them, to care for them, to respect them and to protect their lives. And religion has taught us that even though an act goes against our very sense of compassion and empathy that we have evolved, that that act is permissible and in some cases even moral because it's written in a holy book and is believed to be the word of the creator of the universe. And now think about how every time we eat meat or consume dairy, we are going against our own sense of compassion and empathy. We have had to deaden ourselves to the suffering of these animals. And we love cats and dogs, but cows and pigs, nah, we're fine with them being mutilated and tortured. And as a society, as a society we express disgust at the Yulin Dog Meat Festival, but ignore the fact that hundreds of millions of turkeys will be slaughtered every year for Christians to celebrate Christmas. Cognitive dissonance is the mental discomfort, the psychological stress experienced by a person who simultaneously holds two or more contradictory beliefs, ideas, or values. The occurrence of cognitive, cognitive dissonance is a consequence of a person performing an action that contradicts their personal beliefs, ideals, and values, and also occurs when confronted with, confronted with new information that contradicts said beliefs, ideals, and values. 
Most meat eaters consider themselves to be fair, kind, ethical people who abhor the idea of animal cruelty. And it must take an enormous amount of energy not to acknowledge the torture, mutilation and murder of these sentient beings. Um, and um, it must take an enormous amount of energy to believe that an all-loving deity has created an amazing array of species on this planet of which we are only one and has somehow decided that we are in some way special. And for the record, I'm not saying that all species are the same, but that all species are equal when it comes to their right to live their life without cruelty, without torture, not in servitude and not suffering unnecessary death. And at the beginning of my talk, I spoke about evidence and following the evidence wherever it takes you. And this can be uncomfortable. And you may end up questioning beliefs that you've held all your life and have never questioned before. Beliefs that you and generations before you have come to accept because you've been indoctrinated into them. But when you do this, the reward is that you find a way to live your life that's truly in line with the values and principles that you hold to be true. And to finish, as a vegan, I'd just like to ask the vegetarians in the audience to please examine the evidence and consider veganism. And I'm happy to take any questions that anyone might have.